Omen Sachs College Physics, Chapter 24, Electromagnetic Waves. This is a tough summary because there's a lot of stuff that's very visual and conceptual, and I usually focus on the, the mathematical modeling part of it. So I, I'm just going to talk about stuff and let's just see how far we get. I'll probably have to make a second video with, uh, with some images from the built-in presentation or something like that because uh, it's just hard to see. So we're, we're talking about electromagnetic waves. For me, this is a really big, big deal because there's a lot of stuff that deals with light that we all deal with in everyday life. And it's kind of cool, electromagnetic waves is light. Um, but let me start off with my overall picture for the whole semester uh, that we don't really get to in this algebra-based course. When I teach the calculus-based course, it's a big deal. Uh, and that's Maxwell's equations. So if you think about what we've done so far, You know, we started off looking at what is the electric field, how do we find the electric field, and then we started talking about magnetic field, and then we looked at what about when you change the magnetic field and how that makes an electric field. Uh, these are all part of Maxwell's equations. So I'm gonna, the, the math of these equations is quite not ready for algebra, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about them conceptually, I think we'll be okay. In general, Maxwell's equations uh, tell us that there is an electric field and there's a magnetic field and then there's two shapes of fields and I got this from another book but here we have two shapes of field I'm going to call these shapes and this um, doesn't really talk about it this way shapes I have what's called a which a book called the Coulomb field and that's a shape it could be electric or magnetic except it can't be magnetic and then there's a curly field Okay, so let's talk, and then we have, so we have those shapes, and then we have these uh, types. We have the electric field, and we have the magnetic field. So you can have a Coulomb electric field, you can have a Coulomb, a curly electric field, you can have a curly magnetic field, and there is no Coulomb magnetic field. So let me get into it. I want to show you what a Coulomb field is and a curly field. We have already seen the Coulomb field. If I have an electric charge like this, it makes an electric field that points away from positive charges. That's the first law, the first equation. It's called Gauss's law. And then if you have a negative charge, electric fields point towards it. Gauss's law, okay. Coulomb field, that's what it looks like. It's due to charges. Now there is a Gauss's law for magnetism and it says that this don't happen, right? It says that we don't have magnetic charges. So we don't see this. I mean, they mathematically could exist. We've just never seen them before. So you don't make Coulomb magnetic fields. You can make electric fields with a charge and that's Coulomb charges. So that's Gauss's law and that's uh, Gauss's law for magnetism. Those are the first two. The next one is Faraday's law. And we've already talked about this. Okay, so Faraday's law says that if I have, uh, I can make a curly electric field. So here's what a curly electric field looks like. Notice how it doesn't start and end at a charge, it just kind of makes a circle. That's a curly electric field. How do I make a curly electric field? I need a changing magnetic field. Let's put B. Right. I need a changing magnetic field, and that creates this curly electric field. And that's what we did with Faraday's law. Okay, that's what the delta flux was a changing magnetic field. Faraday's law says you can make a curly electric field with a changing magnetic field. You can make a Coulomb electric field with a charge. You can't make a Coulomb magnetic field. Okay, the last law is the Ampere-Maxwell law. Okay, so Ampere-Maxwell law says that, uh, it's, I'm gonna draw the same picture. Except that's B. I can make 
a chain, a curly magnetic field in the same shape as electric field. I can make that. And how do I make that? Symmetry changing E. So a changing magnetic field makes a curly electric field. A changing electric field makes a curly magnetic field. That's kind of cool, right? Okay, give me sparkles. Thank you. Because I, I did the double thumbs up. Okay. Now, there is, that's the Maxwell part of the Ampere-Maxwell law. The other part, the Ampere part, says that you can also make a curly magnetic field with moving charges. Okay. So there's two ways to make a curly magnetic field, changing electric field and electric current. There's one way to make a changing electric field, changing magnetic field. Why aren't there two ways to make an electric field, curly electric field? Well, technically there would be if you had magnetic charge. If you had a magnetic current, a flow of magnetic charges, which we've never seen, then that would also make a curly electric field. So there's a lot of great symmetry in these Maxwell's equations, and that's the relationship between electric and magnetic field. The math behind it's not too terribly difficult, but not really ready for this course, and so we don't need to talk about that. Okay, so now the big consequence of Maxwell's equations. Remember that if I have, let's put this, I'm going to put this as delta E delta T makes a magnetic field, right? That's the Ampere-Maxwell law. Delta B delta T, the change in the magnetic field, makes an electric field. So these two together means that they can make each other. A changing electric field makes a changing magnetic field that can make a changing electric field, and the cycle continues. And this is what we call an electromagnetic wave. I'll just put EM wave. So let me just go ahead and sketch this out because it's kind of important. So suppose I have a changing electric, it doesn't have to look like this, it's just easiest to draw. So I have a changing electric field that looks like this. These, this is an electric field. That's going to make a changing magnetic field uh, that goes th that comes out. I'll draw it with the circles and dots. So it's going to be out of the board, into the board, out of the board, into the board. And so this is a wave that goes that way. So that's my B. So I make E and B. They're perpendicular to each other, and they make an electromagnetic wave. So you know, you think about waves, and they have properties like the wavelength, which is from here to there, the wavelength, we call that. They have a speed, V. I'll call it C, because we call it the speed of light, C. Um, and then they have a frequency. And I think the book uses the frequency of nu. Now they use F? I'm not sure. So they have a frequency F. So how fast these things op oscillate up and down. All waves have that. You get a wave on a string, and it has those three properties. Um, it also has this E0, the amplitude of the electric field, has a B0, the amplitude of the magnetic field, uh, and we'll get into that too. But the weird thing about electromagnetic waves is that they don't need a medium. So if you think about like uh, a football stadium, and there's people in the stadium, and they do the wave, whoa, whoa, like that. So the people move up and down, the displacement travels around, but if you take away all the people, you don't have a wave, right? They have to have a medium. And so since light is its own medium because it's a changing electric and magnetic field, then it can travel through empty space, which is kind of nice. That's how we get light from the sun, because there's empty space between us and the sun. So the, the electromagnetic wave does not need a medium. It's a little bit different in that way. Now, you know, the one thing that I, I kind of skipped over is that when you use Maxwell's equations to show that it, it obeys the wave equation, which we're not going to do because it recall, requires differential equations and stuff, but when you do that, you can calculate the speed of the wave. C is going to be 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. So remember that epsilon naught, that's that constant from the electric field. Uh, mu naught's a constant from the magnetic field. And if you put in the numbers here, you get 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. 
okay? Which is kind of a big deal. It says that Maxwell's equations would make a wave and that wave would travel that fast. And that's the same speed as the speed of light. And so that's one of the clues that led them to believe that light was an electromagnetic wave. Before they were just looking at electromagnetic waves and, and they didn't know for sure, okay? So light is an electromagnetic wave. All the waves are electromagnetic waves. So in most, is the, unless they're in a vacuum, they're gonna travel at that speed. Doesn't matter if it's a radio wave or what. Um, there's this Maxwell Hertz experiment. Uh, it's kind of cool. They took an oscillating, um, I'm gonna talk about it just for a second, an oscillating voltage source uh, to produce a changing electric field. And then they were able to detect that electric field uh, over here with a spark uh, by making a spark right there. And so this, this changing electric field would make a spark and then this other detector would detect that spark. Um, and I want to mention this because I mentioned it before. This is the earliest version of a radio transmitter uh, called a spark gap transmitter. So you make this spark and it produces electromagnetic radiation of waves that you can detect somewhere else. And the problem with the spark gap transmitter, I mean, you use Morse code, right? Biz, 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 biz. The problem is that it's not on a particular frequency, so it's on all frequencies. So what happens is the loudest, radio, the most powerful radio is the one that gets heard, not, not all of them. So in, in, when the Titanic was sinking, if there's another, if they're broadcasting a signal, but someone has a stronger signal near them, you can't hear them. Okay, we don't do that anymore. Okay, but that's the spark gap. Um, see, this also, uh, is, I don't know if we need that, the strength of the electric field divided by the magnetic field for a wave is going to be the speed of light, uh, which is a constant. Um, yeah, I won't do that. They talk about the, e the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's just mention that because, and there's just a whole bunch of cool demos here, but it's otherwise conceptual. Uh, it turns out that, you know, and you know this, right? I have a window right here. Visible light passes through that. But some things don't pass through it, like ultraviolet light passes through that. I have a wall right here. Radio waves will pass through this. I could pick up radio waves with my phone, Wi-Fi. Uh, it goes right through the wall, but visible light does not. So different wavelengths of matter, of, of electromagnetic waves, interact differently with matter. And so we classify them differently. So I'm just going to, let's do radio infrared, uh, visible, no, let's see, microwaves, I'll put microwaves in there. I'm just going to say something about all these. Microwave, uh, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, um, x-ray, gamma ray. Okay, so this is the basic electromagnetic spectrum starting from the longest wavelength to the shortest up here. So the very, very long wavelengths, we have radio waves. They could be uh, 10 meters long in wavelengths, uh, one meter and so forth. And the microwaves are much shorter, uh, but this is where we get your microwave oven, duh. Um, so it turns out that that's, that particular, you can get a resonance frequency with water to get it to oscillate a lot. And that's how you can heat up stuff. So microwave essentially heat up water. Most food has water in it. Uh, most of your Wi-Fi and LTE is in that range, microwave. Uh, infrared, uh, that's what your, it turns out that all objects give off light based on their temperature. And for most of the things that we see, uh, they give off light, they radiate light in the infrared. So if you have an infrared camera, which they're awesome, I'll show you some pictures, um, you, would, you can detect things and actually see what temperature they are by looking at them with this camera. Then the visible light, we have uh, Roy, G, Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's a seven. There's, there's a reason that indigo's in there for historical reasons. It doesn't really matter. But those are the different, how our eyes perceive different wavelengths as different colors. And then all, and you'll notice infrared is below red. Ultraviolet is below vi uh, above violet. And then for even smaller wavelengths, we have X-rays and gamma rays, and they usually interact with matter at a very high energy level. Uh, and so there's that. Okay, the spectrum. This visible spectrum is 
lambda wavelength 400 nanometers to about 750 nanometers, just, just to give you an idea. So it's a very, very, very tiny window of the full spectrum that we can detect with our eyes. Okay, so we have this is important. This says the speed of light is equal to the frequency of light times the wavelength of light. So if that's a constant, as you increase the wavelength, you decrease the frequency. Okay, but it, it allows us to find something like if you know the wavelength, you can find the frequency. Um, and the frequency would be measured in hertz, the wavelength in meters. And that would give you meters per second. Um, intensity. So this is a, 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 a pretty... Um, intensity of light is defined as the power per area. So that would be in watts per square meter. So the intensity of, of sunlight from the sun at the Earth's position is around 1,000 watts per square meter. So if you have a, a 1 by 1 meter square, then the light incident on it would be 1,000 watts. Uh, if you converted all that to electrical energy, which you can't, then you get a 1,000 watt solar panel. Okay. Um, usually solar panels are 20-25% you know, efficient, so you'd only get like 200 watts. But that's that. And that's only if you have the perfect sun and the sunlight is perpendicular to a panel. So there's a lot of things in there. But in general, we can calculate then the average intensity of, of light as, I'm looking it up because I forgot. Is that right? It says C, C epsilon naught E zero squared over two. So that's the speed of light, that's your constant, and that's the amplitude of the electric field. We could also write that in terms of the magnetic field, which I don't remember this, I'm writing it down. C B zero squared over two mu naught. Uh, we could also write it in terms of both of them, and we get E zero B zero over 2 mu naught. Um, so the 2 is there because what the intensity depends on both the electric field and the magnetic field, so it's basically squared intensity, and then the average of a square sine wave is a half. So that's where that 1 half comes from. Uh, don't forget that we define power as the rate of change of energy with respect to time. And that's that. Okay. So, like I said, there's a whole bunch of interesting uh, applications. I'm going to look at the, I'd like to show you some infrared camera stuff and some other pictures. I'll probably make a short presentation and give it to you, uh, but I haven't done that. I just want to do a chapter summary first. Um, the most important thing in here, I think, uh, other, other than conceptually, are uh, this, oh wait, I didn't I put it up, speed of light, lambda times frequency, um, intensity of light because you can do a whole bunch of cool problems like how you know how much energy do things get what happens what happens as you get further away from a point source that that power is to spread over a larger area so as you get further away the intensity decreases from a point source like a star or a light bulb or things like that okay that's good enough for now